Hi there, my name is Connor Moylan and I am one of the Young Adult Substitute Teaching Leaders for the Young Adult Kansas City class. And I have the privilege of speaking not just to our class tonight, but to the Kansas City men's class. So I'm very grateful for that. If this is the first time you've ever heard one of my lectures, well, welcome. Let's open tonight with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Um, I just pray that you would give me the um, Give me the words that uh, you want me to speak, and I pray that you would also just be with my voice a little bit here, Father, that I would speak uh, loudly and communicate um, well and clearly. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. So, back in the before times, when you could pack 70,000 people in Arrowhead Stadium, and you know, 40,000 or so in Kauffman Stadium, there were lots of things that took place in these stadiums before, during, and after the games. Um, the, the respective sports that they were playing. One thing that took place with increasing frequency, at least when I was there, particularly if the game was on national television, was the military family reunion. It would start out at some break in the action. A military family, with a single parent and most likely a couple of younger kids, would come out into the center of the field and receive a huge ovation from the crowd, cheering the family on in support of their own sacrifice that they have to make by having a uh, parent overseas. Then, from a hidden spot from somewhere, that other parent would, would not actually be overseas. They would be in the stadium. They would run out and greet his or her family, catching them completely off guard. The reunion was always joyous, overwhelming, moving. A family reunited after pain, struggle, a long time apart, and the potential to never see that person ever again. There were few dry eyes that, in the crowd when one of these reunions took place. That's sort of what I picture when I imagine the reunions for the two passages that we see tonight. There are two major reunions, the first with Joseph and his brothers, the second with Joseph and his father. Both are incredibly moving scenes, and they are highlights of the two sections that we have tonight. So I'll split this up into two sections. The first section is Genesis 45 verses 1 through 24, titled Joseph and his brothers reunite, while a second section, which starts with Genesis 45 verse 25, goes all the way to Genesis 47 verse 12, is titled Israel and family head to Egypt. Let's dive into the first section. We start off chapter 45 with Joseph unable to contain himself any longer, dismissing everyone from his presence except his brothers. When I imagine this scene, I picture Joseph just almost vibrating shaking from all of the emotions that are coursing through him. He's kept his cool pretty well so far, but after witnessing Judah's transformation from someone who would sell his own brother to turn a small prophet, to someone who is willing to intercede and sacrifice his own life for the presumed guilty brother, Joseph can no longer hold back his emotions. He confesses to his brothers who he is, and he asks them if Jacob, their father, is still alive. Understandably, his brothers are completely shocked, terrified, and are unable to answer him. Let's read Joseph's response to them and start pulling out some threads, starting with verse 5. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no, no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Joseph's response to his brothers can teach us a lot about two big topics that are sometimes a little conflated, forgiveness and reconciliation. Let's start with forgiveness. Joseph has clearly forgiven his brothers for their sin against him. And his actions before this chapter show this as well. He sent his brothers home with their silver, not just to trick with them, like it was nice to send them back with the money. And he allowed them to return home in that moment so they could feed their families. This is no small feat. Uh, this is no small feat, excuse me, on the part of Joseph. Now, thankfully, I have not been kidnapped and sold into slavery, but those are pretty evil crimes, and I imagine the pain from them sticks with you for a while, tempting you to sow bitterness and hatred in your heart. The pain had to be even worse since the sin came from his own family. Wounds from those closest to you tend to hurt the most. And yet we see Joseph has not allowed that deep wound to become infected, but is instead consoling his own brothers in this moment, the same ones who sold him into slavery, 
and telling them to let go of their distress and self-loathing about what happened. That's incredible. It's a miracle. The type of transformation possible only with the help of the one true God. Even if we have a personal relationship with Yahweh, like Joseph, like Joseph did, we can also see practical application in what aspect, what doctrine of God Joseph understands and has full faith in. It is God's sovereignty. Joseph is able to understand that God is in charge and sovereign over what happens, and that God needed him to be in Egypt at this appointed time. This helps him understand and accept why he experienced what he experienced and why he suffered. Paul tells us the same thing, or a version of this thing, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all, thing God, all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Now, this does not mean that all things are good, but God can and does work for the good of all things, whether those things were originally good or evil. Joseph truly believes that, and it allows him to not hold on to the bitterness and blame for what has happened, but instead forgive his brothers for their evil. The other thing that Joseph has on his side that is important when coming to grips with God's sovereignty, especially in really difficult situations, is time. It's been 20 years, over 20 years actually, since he has seen his brothers, which has given him time to grow in faith, wrestle with God, and make peace with the situation, and forgive and heal. If Joseph had seen his brothers one week after being sold into slavery, um, I'm doubtful the conversation would have been this pleasant. And that's really understandable. When you're hurting, I mean really hurting, and feel just incapable, overwhelmed by the pain, it's not really helpful to hear about someone reminding you that, oh, don't you know God's in charge? That he can, he, this situation will be good. In those moments, it's more important just to acknowledge, feel, wrestle with your pain, your feelings, and just desperately cling to God and hold on. But time will go on, and as time goes on, the wound will be a little less fresh. And after that, to truly move forward in healing and forgiveness, you will need to recognize that God is sovereign, and he can, take, he can work good out of your pain and suffering, like we see happen with Joseph here. Again, it's been a long time for Joseph to reach this point. So if, if you're not there yet, it's okay. But are you still clinging to old grievances, no matter how painful, unfair, evil what happened to you was? If you still cling to those, you are not truly forgiving whoever did that to you. And that bitterness is now affecting you. Do you truly believe that God is sovereign and can work things, all things, for good? Then it's time to start the painful, yet life-giving process of submitting to God and releasing those old wounds. Forgiving. And then watch God open your eyes to see what He is doing, where you are at right now, which is where He wants and needs you to be. Forgiveness, however, does not necessarily mean reconciliation between the two parties. We see reconciliation in this case, thank God, but that's because the offending party, the brothers, have actually shown they are changed men. Joseph would have still been called to wrestle with his pain and forgive his brothers, no matter what. But the overwhelming emotion that he feels is because his brothers show they are worthy of forgiveness, which allows for reconciliation. If they had waltzed in and acted pompous or just thrown Benjamin under the bus, reconciliation, it could not have happened. And that would have, you know, that would have frankly been understandable and if not arguably the correct thing. But we thank God that there was reconciliation in this case because it was a beautiful scene and one that we should aspire to in our own lives. If you are the aggrieved party, you should work hard and wrestle with your feelings so you can truly forgive. If you are the offending party, you should work hard, you should confess what you did wrong, and make noticeable and genuine attempts to improve your behavior. You know, you won't be perfect, but people know if you're actually trying or not. Most of the time, both parties have a grievance and have offended, so you often you will need to forgive and accept forgiveness, and work towards change and growth all in one. But this work is beautiful, because it allows for relationships to be restored even ones that seem like they should be unsalvageable. And a great place to start with reconciliation is in your own relationship with God. To put it bluntly, <laughs> you are the offending party in this relationship. 
We all are. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is, you are already forgiven by God. You just need to accept that forgiveness and work towards change and growth by confessing that Jesus is Lord. Jesus' death and resurrection allows us to be reconciled to God. And we know that God is just as moved as Joseph was when we allow that reconciliation to take place. As we move on, keep the brother's reaction in the back of your mind. It will come up again. Sometimes it's the most difficult part is actually accepting that you are truly forgiven. Whether it's in your personal relationship or with your relationship with God. Let's jump back into the narrative. Joseph asks them to bring Jacob and their families to Egypt. He knows that there are still five more years of famine coming. And they need a solution that will keep them all alive and together as a family. He then embraces Benjamin, and they have, a, they have their own beautiful reunion. Benjamin was still likely a child or an early teenager when Joseph left. Now he's a grown man. Pharaoh is pleased when he hears about Joseph's family re, is reuniting, which I think reveals how much Pharaoh respects Joseph personally. We know that the Egyptians don't really care for the Hebrews, but Joseph has saved his people and brought blessing to his nation. So if Joseph is happy, it seems like Pharaoh's happy. Pharaoh blesses the family and tells them they will be taken care of of land to themselves and plenty of possessions. And Joseph loads his brothers up with clothes, provisions, food, you know, particularly Benjamin, and like a doting parent instructs his brothers, don't quarrel on the way. My principle for this first section is God can restore what sin has destroyed. Sin destroyed this family, driving Joseph into slavery, his brothers into guilt and shame, and Jacob into deep, just almost unshakable mourning. And yet, using that sinful action, God restored this family and set them up to experience the wonderful gifts of forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. Do you have an old festering wound that won't go away? Trust in the sovereignty and the perfection of God to deliver you from that situation and turn evil into good, even if you don't yet see how that is going to happen. Is someone offering you forgiveness, but you still feel shame about what you did and you're struggling to accept that forgiveness? Trust and believe that God has forgiven you and wants you to experience the joy and freedom that comes from accepting forgiveness, whether it's from Him or from someone offering it to you, and banish your shame. The second section of our passage, again, Genesis 45, 25, through the end of the section, 47, 12, chronicles the journey of the family of Israel to Egypt so they can be reunited with Joseph and safe from the famine. Now, I'm not going to split this up in the order it appears in the text. Instead, we're going to talk first about what this move meant for the people of Israel, and then we'll talk about the man himself, Israel, Jacob, and what we can learn from him in this section. We are told in chapter 46, verses 6 and 7, that Jacob brought everyone in his family and all the livestock and possessions from Canaan with him into the Promised Land, or in, from Canaan into Egypt. Excuse me. We know that they will not return to the Promised Land for 400 years, over 400 years. And when they will, they will be many more people. It's worth pointing out that we are told 66 men went with Joseph when they went into Egypt, or excuse me, Jacob. And when they leave, they will number 600,000 men. Even though their time in Egypt is full of struggles and trials, we see how God is still with them and blesses them throughout it all in the way that he increases their number. We get another genealogy in this section. I know this was your favorite part, which, we're, which were kept for legal purposes. But Bob Deffenbaugh of Dallas Theological Seminary also points out another interesting fact about this genealogy. He writes, all those named in Numbers 26 as heads of tribes or families are found in this listing of descendants in Genesis 46, the one that we read. Moses here intended not to name every person who went into Egypt, but every leader of family or clan who would come forth from Egypt. It was vitally important for those who came forth from Egypt to know their roots, since the land would be divided according to tribes. Now, we not only see the roots the families and their leaders being described in this passage of scripture, we also see the seeds of where future tension will lie. Let's jump back into the text at the end of chapter 46, verse 31. We have just seen Joseph and Jacob have their moving reunion, and Joseph preps five of his, five of his brothers to meet Pharaoh. 
Then Joseph said to his brothers and his, to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds, they tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, What is your occupation? You should answer, Your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Again, we see Joseph the meticulous planner, prepping his brothers to say exactly what he wants them to understand, and understand what they need to say to Pharaoh the most powerful man in the known world, and not screw things up. We see at the start of Genesis 47, the brothers do what they're told. Pharaoh grants them the land in Goshen to settle, giving them the best part of the land to settle. Now this decision has big implications for the future of Israel. We are told that all shepherds are detestable to Egyptians, so presumably Goshen is a little bit off the beaten path, or at least kept the Hebrews somewhat removed from the Egyptians, so they wouldn't have to interact with them. This will help keep this fledging nation holy, set apart from the Egyptians, particularly in culture and religion, something that God won from his people. We've seen examples in Genesis and Lot and Judah. They failed when they separated from their family and integrated with their more unrighteous neighbors. Joseph was strong enough to survive in the city in the palace life and keep his faith intact with the Lord. But I think we can safely assume that most of his family is not and would have been consumed with the Egyptian way of life had they settled somewhere else. God is always working, even in the details of where his people will live. This isolation and being detestable to the Egyptians, however, does lay the groundwork for the future oppression the Israelites will face. They will remain a mostly separate people in Egypt for 400 years and grow immensely in number. The fact that they had some of the best land surely helped the nation multiply. And in the future, the Egyptians will look around and see what they perceive as a potentially hostile nation living within their own borders. But all of that is in a future study. Come back to us when, when BSF does My Life of Moses someday. Let's end our lecture today talking about Jacob, who really returns in a big way in this passage after being a little bit more on the periphery for most of the Joseph story. At first, Jacob cannot believe the news, but when he sees the carts that Joseph sent back, his spirit is revived. My mental image of Jacob is when he hears this news is like Grandpa Joe in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Bedridden until he hears something, something good, some good news, and then pops up singing, puts on his nice pair of clothes, ready to go. Before going to Egypt, however, Jacob stops at Beersheba and to offer sacrifices and consult with the Lord before making this journey. This shows growth, real growth, in Jacob's relationship with the Lord, and is an incredibly wise decision for multiple reasons. First, Jacob knows he's supposed to end up in the Promised Land, where, and when he has wandered in the past without consulting God, things ended up going awry for him and his family. Things also went awry for his family the last time they journeyed to Egypt, with Abraham and Sarah picking up Hagar as a slave, Abraham deceiving Pharaoh about his relationship with Sarah, and Lot falling in love with the comforts of the Egyptian lifestyle, which will come back to haunt him. Choosing to stop in Beersheba shows that he is trying to communicate with God and listen to his wisdom, as Beersheba is the spot where we have seen Hagar, Abraham, and Isaac all encounter God, as well as Jacob. God hears Jacob's prayer and answers in dramatic fashion, speaking to the patriarch in a vision. The notes tell us that God repeated his promises because he is faithful to keep his word and because Jacob needed to remember what was true. He calls out Jacob personally by his old name, Jacob, the name of his weakness. God reminds Jacob that he will be with him in Egypt. We know that the whole earth is the Lord's. Nowhere we go, we can be separated from the Lord. He repeats his promise that Jacob will be a great nation. And he comforts him by telling him, Joseph will be with you at the very end. He will close your eyes. Jacob was blessed to be in a relationship with a God who hears and responds to his prayers. And so are we. The next time we see Jacob, he is in Goshen and finally reuniting with Joseph. Another emotionally impacting scene. I mean, I even feel like an interloper when I just try to immensely picture or imagine the scene. This is so moving. You know people are experiencing powerful emotions when they can't even sum up words to speak. All they can do is hug and cry. 
Israel declares that he finally feels like he can pass away. He's clearly found the inner peace that only God can bring. We get one more scene with Jacob in this section, and it go, it's when he goes and meets Pharaoh. We get four short verses about their interaction, but there are multiple takeaways we can pull from this section. Let's start by reading Genesis 47, starting with verse 7. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his parents. Presents. It's nice to witness interactions between people who have every reason to be arrogant and prideful, but show humility and deference instead. Pharaoh, again, the most powerful man in the known world, chooses to receive a blessing from this old man who he's never met before. He is also clearly impressed by him, by his age, and wants to know more about this interesting person brought before him. Even, in your, even if your work or life situation puts you, you know, above someone else, it is always the right thing to do to show respect to everyone you meet and find a reason to be interested in their story. All of us are made in God's image, and we can learn something from anyone we meet. And Jacob doesn't use his face time with the king to puff himself up. Instead, he informs the ruler that his life has been hard and difficult. It's been a pilgrimage. He also calls his years few, trying to downplay them. He tells Pharaoh that, no, they don't equal the years of my forefathers, adopting a position of humility. Their humble and respectful exchange begins and ends with Jacob giving Pharaoh a blessing which is more than just pleasantries and a polite greeting. Let's go back to the all-important Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 through 3, where God tells Abram what he's going to do with him and his family and why. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham's family, with Jacob currently as the leader, is supposed to be a blessing and bless all peoples on earth. So far, that hasn't been going very well. We've seen the family of Israel murder the men of an entire town. So, you know, that's the exact opposite of a blessing. And they haven't been able to be a blessing towards each other. The whole, you know, let's sell Joseph into slavery thing going on. And yet God is still able to work, turn evil into good. And we see how these promises are being fulfilled in this particular generation, even if they do receive their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Their family name has become great, with Joseph second in charge of Egypt. They have been a blessing to Egypt and all the surrounding peoples by ensuring there would be food during the seven years of famine. Jacob, who has received God's blessings throughout his entire life, is finally fulfilling his role by passing that blessing on to others so that all the peoples on the earth can be blessed. God does not give us blessings so we can hoard them. Instead, we are called to bless and be a blessing to others. And it's not too late. It's never too late to start fulfilling that role that God has planned for you. We've seen Jacob's story. We've seen how long his pilgrimage has been. We've seen how much things went awry and how much he suffered. If it wasn't too late for Jacob to fulfill the role of being a blessing to others at 130, then it isn't too late for us either. No matter what we suffered, no matter what our life was like before, no matter the sins we've committed, we can take up the call to take up the call today to bless the nations as God's people. Remember, God is committed to turning evil into good, and that includes our very own lives. My principle for the second and final section is God leads his children where they need to go so they can grow. Jacob has been on a long journey, but he has grown, and we see the results of the growth in this chapter. God will continue to lead his children, the people of Israel, as they multiply in the land of Egypt. And he continues to lead his children today so we can grow in our own faith. And I pray that Jacob wouldn't be an example to all of us. It's not too late to start on the path that God has for you. Go and be a blessing in someone else's life. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gifts. We thank you for your gifts of forgiveness, of reconciliation, and of just goodness, Father. I pray that you'd be with all of us this week. Pray that we could just find in our hearts to love and forgive somebody. I pray that we can also accept forgiveness, especially if that forgiveness is from you, so there'd be no more shame. And I pray that 
no matter we are, where we are in our journey, that this week we would go out and we would be a blessing unto others. We ask all of this in our son's name. Amen. Thank you all and have a good night.